The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Let's, uh, let's talk about Hume and what this uh, uh, Dialogues is up to. Uh, dialogues concerning natural religion. So what is natural religion and what's it to be compared to? What, what, do, you, what do you think somebody means? Uh, did you sort of grasp as you read uh, what he's getting at when he's talking about natural religion? Um, so natural religion means um, approaching religion from a reason standpoint rather than belief. Yeah. So trying to reason your way through it. Yeah, natural religion is the idea of looking for evidences of uh, the creation by looking at uh, nature itself. So the saying was up through nature to nature's God. If we look at nature, we can see evidences of a creator. And this is very much part of the expression of um, uh, Wordsworth's poem. I mean, Wordsworth goes into nature and he sees evidences of a spiritual being that simply comes to him through his, uh, his uh, feeling and his intuition and his experience in the natural world. And so natural religion was a emergence in the 18th century. And it's, uh, it's often associated with the product of uh, the Enlightenment. So what other kinds of religion are there? Well, I mean, they don't talk about like any uh, biblical text or anything. Right. So that's the completely different side of it. So the other, the other approach to, to religion, religion is what we call revealed religion. A religion that's revealed through a sacred text. So you, uh, you read the Bible and you see the accounts in the Bible and <clears throat> this is something that has been revealed, revelation, through revelation. So they, uh, in, in, this, in this book, in Hume's book, we have this dialogue about these different kinds of religion and the origin of the world. Uh, I mean, they're talking about creation, they're talking about the natural world, uh, and how did it come into existence? Yes? At the same time, they're not concerning themselves with whether or not God exists. That's not even a question that's being put on the table. They're just like, well, it's perfectly clear that God's here, so let's just figure out how he works, and, you know, or there's a thing to say, as what's God's nature? So. Yeah. Partially. Yes, yes. yes. Okay. I mean, uh, not totally. Oh, okay. I mean, we, we have some skepticism going on in here. So as we read through this book, we're going to find a lot of different complex positions okay. because we have three characters here. And each one has a sort of different take on things. And so Hume has sort of set them in this library and they're having this, this, uh, this discourse. They're kind of talking. And what are the, what are the three? What, what are they like? Uh, we're still on this question. We're ex what what are the three characters like? Uh, he says the three discussants. Uh, these are Hume's own words. Uh, one is uh, this Demia, who is said to be an orthodox. Uh, has an orthodox view of the world, uh, of religion, religious orthodoxy. But Hume, in Hume's account, he says, uh, he, we can talk about the Mia in a minute, <coughs> that it's rigid, sort of a rigid orthodoxy. Then we have Cleanthes, and Cleanthes is the second discussant. And what sort of things is Cleanthes interested in? Did you pick that up as you? Promoting natural religion. Yes. 
He's the one who says, look out and you see this great universe. It's like uh, the great machine of the universe. It's so perfectly, beautifully designed that how could we doubt that some great <coughs> creator made it? And we'll come back to that argument. Then we have Philo, who is this, he likes to sort of, uh, he likes to sort of poke and, and oppose and He's playing some game here. And you didn't get too much exposure to Philo <coughs> in the first part, or Philo, whatever. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the first three chapters that I had you read, uh, he doesn't really come out except as a kind of, he's always offering an oppositional view. So uh, it turns out that he's going to be much more a skeptic. So we're going to get a skeptic. And of course we know that Hume himself was a skeptic, and there's been many, many debates over, well, you know, which one of these guys <laughs> does Hume, uh, represents Hume's view? And, you know, there's, there's been some ink spilt on this, this set of questions. We can, we can decide ourselves. But so you have these, these three different approaches. And, of course, um, this is all uh, in, 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 in the cause of trying to discuss this, this world and how, how the world came into existence. So if we go back to the start, let me say a few things uh, first about Hume. Uh, uh, David Hume was one of the great uh, philosophers of the Enlightenment. Uh, he was very much uh, a philosophical skeptic. He, uh, he, he had problems with arguments about miracles. Uh, we'll look at his, uh, he, he rejected the notion of a miracle as something that is simply, doesn't fit within the experience of, uh, of uh, doesn't fit within human experience itself. Miracles are, uh, in, in Hume's view, are simply don't make any sense in the rational order of things. Uh, we'll look at this in a minute. Uh, he's, he's considered an empiricist, and by empiricist we mean uh, a, a philosophy that's based on inductive reasoning from uh, experience to generalizations. So rather than the deductive from principles to uh, conclusions. Uh, and he's associated with uh, naturalism. What do you think naturalism refers to? <coughs> Ever come across that word? What do you think it would mean? I know this, this is, is all sort of a lot of isms here. Yeah. Well, naturalism came across that in art history, um, but it, there it meant more of kind of exposing what nature really is like. Nature isn't all like ideal and stuff. Or there's some like grittiness to nature and it's also that also comes that also should, should come through. Okay. I looked up uh, the definition of naturalism uh -huh. and came across two two definitions. One is methodology methodological uh, naturalism. The other was epidemiological uh, naturalism. And I wasn't sure which one. Epistemological. Yeah. Epistemological. So naturalism really refers to an approach to experience that simply holds that experience can only be explained with principles that have been observed in the natural world. That uh, explanations that move beyond the experience of the natural world are simply not accepted. So naturalism uh, is an approach to knowledge that incorporates all explanation and even questions to uh, previously determined elements of experience. So uh, it's really a naturalistic approach. It's, it's, a, it's an approach to physical experience, to uh, experience itself that's based on, always uh, based on prior experience. Um, and the idea that uh, what we've observed in nature is pretty much the limit of <laughs> what we're going to get. Uh, if we want to go beyond nature for extra natural explanations, uh, the naturalist refuses to go into that direction. So these are 
these are approaches that are associated with the Enlightenment. Uh, and the Enlightenment was, of course, a product of the great scientific revolution. Uh, Newton was, uh, I mean, uh, Hume discusses Newton in the book. And why is Newton so important? Well, Newton, yes. Uh, Newton extended. So, so Newton's Principia extended the laws that are observed around us beyond the Earth. The notion that gravity is a universal phenomenon that is not simply limited to a local environment, but actually in Newton's uh, accounts, uh, he involved celestial bodies, the motion of celestial bodies, and the whole notion that the empirical observations of humans really extended to cosmic scale. Hume was the uh, inheritor of this tradition, and he, uh, in, in the dialogues here, he, he refers to he refers to, to Newton as uh, one of the great uh, uh, prior figures. And of course, this is partly because he's trying to understand in this dialogue what various kinds of views of the creation or, or the, uh, of the world itself. I, I want to get away from the word, word creation. I think you're quite right. They're not interested in the origins. They're interested in, uh, I mean, in some sense they're interested in origins, but they're interested in what can we say about the world as a, a whole or an entity as far as its origins uh, or the way it operates. So, I, you know, there's some... Okay, so we, we start out here with uh, the three discussants in, in, in the library. The library is a great setting. Um, there are a lot of um, interesting aspects to this dialogue. Um, one of the things that's taking place, of course, is uh, a lot of changes in terms of... Uh, the way in which people are beginning to study the world itself. Uh, there was, of course, Franklin's great experiments. These were on people's minds, the fact that he began to connect uh, electricity to the operation of uh, the world, and he began to find out uh, fundamental truths about uh, uh, the way in which energy is transformed uh, or transmitted. There, this this uh, painting here is a painting uh, titled Men of Progress in the 1860s. And this notion that uh, people were beginning to uh, uh, find out empirically new ways of understanding. There was this notion that uh, uh, the, that the, the uh, the, the knowledge of the world was not a static thing. It was something that people could actually understand and advance, the notion that you could advance understandings. Uh, so these are, these are American inventors, uh, Morse, Colt, McCormick, uh, Henry, a number of people who were uh, imp important in uh, all sorts of different innovations from reapers to revolving pistols to uh, uh, various electromagnetic phenomena. They were all studying. So the study of the world, the study of, the, uh, of, of uh, nature itself was on the march. And there were incredible amounts of new understand, uh, 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 incredible amounts of new data. And, uh, new understanding of the world. So this is all coming in uh, around, uh, this is uh, over a hundred years before Darwin wrote, um, uh, when, when Hume actually published his book. So Hume is, uh, he, well not when he published, he wrote the book in 1857. It didn't get published until later. But uh, he's, he's really in the midst of a revolution that's taking place as far as knowledge. And uh, he uses a dialogic form here in, in this book, the dialogues, 
What's good about a dialogue? Uh, well, I kind of think, like, as we said earlier, that like, we can't really pinpoint which one he's representing. <coughs> so it's kind of like is a veil of uh, anonymity, anonymity. Like so, so people can't necessarily accuse him of being a skepticism right away. Okay, so there's that aspect. aspect. He, he, he doesn't necessarily get a, uh, identified with any single view. Yeah. Okay. He can approach a bunch of different uh, views mm -hmm. without it being like awkward to read and write. It, mm -hmm. The dialogue lends itself to having different sort of ideas all put together rather than having to like, separate them in like different chapters. Or Yes, uh, dialogue is, uh, has this, tact, this, this uh, give and take that allows an outside observer to sort of think and make a decision. And this is really something that was part of the experimental movement that came, that developed with the Royal Society uh, of London and gentlemen of science who actually uh, did experiments in front of each other and talked about the experiments and debated them and so on and so forth. This notion of debate and observation and comparison uh, emerged uh, from the 17th century into the 18th century as uh, an important way to sort of discover. Uh, and, you know, letting people do give and take allows people to uh, contradict each other, challenge each other, suggest new possibilities, and in general opens up the, the way in which uh, we can discover new, new things. It's very much a kind of uh, uh, a generative literary form, if you will. It generates new understandings. Any other thoughts on dialogue? Yeah. This is a fairly touchy topic in the 18th century, wouldn't you imagine? I mean, you know, they get out there and start talking about, well, <laughs> what are the possibilities for the, uh, for the way in which nature operates and it's coming into existence? So this brings us to our first, uh, our, first, uh, 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 our first presenter. And the first presenter is, of course, Demia. This is in... Uh, Actually, the uh, Demia's uh, presentation actually begins in the second, I mean, in earnest. So what kind of approach does he have of, um, I can find him here. So, what kind of approach does he have? We, we've humans call them a, a rigid orthodox, but uh, is that your your view of his uh, his presentation? He starts right out at the in the in the first chapter, and he says, "So um, he says I must own Cleanthes." said the Mia, that nothing can more surprise me than the light in which you have all along put this argument, referring to the argument of the existence of God. By the whole tenor of your discourse, one would imagine that you were imagining the being of God against the cavils of atheists and infidels, and were necessitated to become a champion for that fundamental principle of all religion, i.e. the existence of God. But this, I hope, is not by any means a question among us. I mean, he's assuming we're all members of a, you know, civilized, uh, what, he, what he would say is civilized Christian society. But this, I hope, is not by any means a question among us. No man, no man at least of common sense, I am persuaded, ever entertained a serious doubt with regard to the truth so certain and self-evident. The question is not concerning the being, but the nature of God. This I affirm from the infirmities of human understanding to be altogether incomprehensible and unknown to us. The essence of that supreme mind, his attributes, the manner of his existence, the very nature of his duration are mysterious to men. Uh, finite, weak, blind creatures, we ought to humble ourselves in his august presence 
and conscious of our frailties, adore in silence his infinite perfections. The eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, nor hath it entered into the heart of man to conceive them. They are covered in a deep cloud from human curiosity. It is profaneness to attempt penetrating through these uh, sacred obscurities. And next to the impiety of denying his existence is the temerity, the cheek, of prying into his nature and essence, decrees and attributes. Pretty strong statement, isn't it? Good old-fashioned rational thinking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. This is, you know, you, you should, should not, not even go into this territory. Just bow down and, 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 and you know, thank God for what you have and, and, uh, and appreciate your existence and save your soul by adoring God. So this is a, this is, this is a uh, what Hume uh, takes as an orthodox, orthodox position. Uh, is there any, uh, so is, yeah, it's old fashioned, good old fashioned. Any other thoughts on this? Well, one of the things that I found interesting, and this is another quote from the book, is like, or how do you mystics who maintain absolute incomprehensibility of the deity differ from skeptics or atheists who assert that the first cause is all unknown and unintelligible? So I think that fits in really well. Like if, if you say this is absolutely, we can't understand it, how is that any different from not believing it in the first place? Good question. Uh, how is it? Any thoughts? Um, well, I mean, I, I think there's a difference between like, believe, believing in a god and then saying we can't uh, understand anything he does, but in, in this context, when they're talking more about uh, like natural religion, I, I, I think it's pretty similar. So. I mean, there is. Uh, I think Philo brings up this parallel that there is some similarity between the simply the position of simply saying we can't understand and the skeptic's position. Uh, he associates in one place with the Pyrrhonist view, the idea that you destroy all knowledge, no knowledge, nothing is valid. But uh, those positions, as you, you're quite right, have, uh, th there is a certain parallel there. However, the first position assumes that God exists. In fact, Nia says, well, we're not going to discuss this question. This is surely not a question anybody rational would want to discuss. So he's simply assuming this is this is this is it. Where whereas a skeptic, the position of a skeptic is going to be more what? That there is no God. Yeah, I mean until so you, you can show me some evidence uh, of, you know, I'm I have no basis for belief. So those are two similar positions in a curious way, and yet completely opposite in their ultimate view of, of, of uh, the nature of God or whether God exists. Are you going to say? Uh, I thought it was sort of interesting how Cleanthes, um, his view doesn't um, have any aspect of inquiry um, in terms of Cleanthes? Uh, you're talking about Cleanthes? Or, or, or Demia? Uh, oh, yeah, Demia, sorry. Yeah. Deems yeah. Demia. Okay. Um, Go ahead. Yeah. Just because uh, in the beginning, they talked about different ways of teaching their students. And then yeah. Demia said, you should teach everything first and then teach religion afterwards. Okay. But wouldn't education in itself lead to inquiry and more curiosity? Well, yeah. yeah. So you're you're touching on this 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 question of the natural religion. So revealed religion is really what Demias does. I mean, he 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 is he's read he's read his sacred texts. He believes uh, uh, he believes deeply in these texts. He has a certain pious view of the world. He has a certain yeah, he's orthodox and rigid, but he's also, you know, he has a certain kind of uh, uh, faith, if you will, that there is 
a deity, and he 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 supports that faith with uh, a passionate devotion to his sense of the deity. I mean, so I mean, it's 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 easy to kind of say, well, this guy doesn't have any, you know, he hasn't really done any research or anything like that. To him, research is beside the point. We're talking about something that uh, exists at a scale that is just too vast and too uh, beyond human frailty to understand much about. And to actually use the reason to try to understand God is, in Demia's view, kind of a profane, sacrilegious thing. And, you know, the, this is something that uh, can be associated with, you know, a very earnest sense of piety. So, so then we have, okay, so yeah, there isn't, there isn't a whole lot of um, uh, experiential inquiry. So now we have Cleanthes who comes in. And uh, Cleanthes, here he is. So, you know, there's a little bit of uh, discourse about uh, the first cause, the great first cause, God. And uh, Cleanthes really feels that he's sort of supporting Demia in some sense. Um, so he says, uh, not to lose any time in circ circumlocution, said Cleanthes, addressing himself to Demia, much less in replying to the pious declamations of Philo. I shall briefly explain how I conceive this matter, i.e. of the nature of God. Look around the world. Contemplate the whole and every part of it. You will find it to be nothing but one great machine, subdivided into an infinite number of lesser machines, which again admit of subdivisions to a degree beyond what human senses and faculties can trace and explain. All these various machines, even their most minute parts, are adjusted to each other with an accuracy which ravishes into admiration all men who have ever contemplated them. The curious adapting of means to ends, remember that design definition? The curious adapting of means to ends throughout all nature resembles exactly, though it much exceeds the productions of human contrivance, of human design, thought, wisdom, and intelligence. Since therefore the effects resemble each other, we are led to infer by all the rules of analogy that the causes also resemble, and that the author of nature is somewhat similar to the mind of man. Though possessed of much larger faculties proportioned to the grandeur of the work which he has executed, by this argument a posteriori, and by this argument alone, we do prove that at once the existence of a deity and a similarity to human mind and intelligence. Okay, what about this? So. I think that um, <coughs> so this is Cleanthes' point of view, and I think that Cleanthes, coming from a, a more scientific um, uh, perspective, this worldview, this, like, this perspective is um, kind of skewed in a overly rigorous um, kind of sense in that like so from just from that you can see already see how it's kind of like the scientific process where he notices something and then he's reasoning through and saying oh therefore therefore um, but then I think there's like he's not it's like sometimes science is a little rigid and I think that's where he might fall short a little. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think Cleanthes argument um, confuses correlation with causality, mm -hmm. in the sense that he sees all these patterns, but it's not necessarily the case that A implies B. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he makes uh, an analogy. Yeah, that's Philo's, I think. Jennifer, what do you think of this this great machine in the universe? Do you think that's uh, do you think it's true that the universe is a great, beautiful machine that operates with incredible complexity and you know, it's always sort of mysterious but uh, phenomenally interesting? Well, yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it, but like 
I don't know. I kind of agree with um, <laughs> Chris in that, like, it's it's kind of a broad analogy. Like, it's, you can't really compare such like something as such a vast scope to like what humans design because it's like it incorporates. I think um, Philo was saying that. Um, the whole universe consists of man and what he creates, so you can't really compare the two because one of them encompasses the other, and it's just so grand of a, mm -hmm. like... I guess we're... we're isn't, isn't the world incredibly... I mean, don't you, when you take a course in physics or chemistry, uh, don't you marvel at how, you know, amazingly arranged and organized things actually appear to be if we have the if we have the mental power to penetrate this this complexity I mean aren't we always discovering especially in, in if you're in the sciences or if you're in the ply the amazing way in which things are organized the periodic table I mean you know things that I mean really that's it's pretty impressive isn't, isn't it? it if, if you, you look, look at, at the, the order of the world, world and the fact that I mean if the world were not orderly in some incredible way, we ought, none of us would be here. We're here because we can study phenomena and <coughs> find patterns and recognize those patterns and make in inferences from those patterns and move on to the next. And you know, uh, think of the you know the double helix. Think of the you know, <laughs> it's, it's amazing, isn't it? I mean, this is not a foolish thing to say, that the universe or, or the world and nature itself is organized at a level that we're still trying to understand, but we've understood a lot. There are order, there are principles in this world that we can study in a deep way and get deep knowledge from. And if that order did not exist, we couldn't get to first base. So that was part of the rational, that was the inheritance of the scientific revolution, Newton moving into the enlightenment, of which Hume is a major exponent, express of, of this, this new understanding or this new sense that nature itself had an order of profoundly de uh, determinable order that we can understand. And it sits right at the core of Charles Darwin and his thinking that if we penetrate deeply enough into the way nature works, we can understand complexities that previous generations just, you know, threw up their hands at. Philo, Philo is, you know, he's a troublemaker. He's, he's always, you know, so he doesn't he responds to Cleanthes in a, in a curious and interesting way. He says, uh, you know, first of all, his critique of Cleanthes, you know, great machine of the, of the universe, this great cosmic machine as showing this, this principle of order coming out from the mind of a great creator. Uh, his first critique of that, Philo's, uh, Philo's first critique of that is what? He mentions the limits of analogy. Oh, <laughs> what does he mean by the limits of analogy? Well, Cleanthes is arguing analogically, is he not? He's saying that, you know, okay, this is a great ordered machine of the, the, the world. We know this from the scientific revolution and the way things work. Uh, we know that there's incredible mass of degree of order in existence. And that order, because we can understand it with our minds, and because that is the product of a greater mind, our minds must be similar in some way to the mind of that great creator, because we can understand that great creator's works. And uh, this, this uh, feel really finds this uh, problematic because, uh, as he says, you know, the analogy of, you know, the mind of a human or even the analogy of uh, 
of a, of a machine and the universe itself, it just doesn't hold because there's, there's so different in scale. It, it, it's just kind of, it's nice to write, but in the end it, <coughs> it's just too different a set of phenomena to actually compare them. I mean, how can you compare something of the scale of the universe itself to uh, the order of something that uh, humans would make? So in this sense, he sort of agrees with Demia. You know, it's only from a skeptical point of view. Then he says, um, so he says, uh, this is in, in part two here, uh, uh, but wherever you depart, in at least from the similarity of cases, you diminish proportionally the evidence and may at last bring it to a very weak analogy which is confessedly liable to error and uncertainty. Okay, so let me, um, so the analogical reasoning, reasoning this is Philo again, uh, is much weaker when we infer the circulation of the sap in vegetables from our experience that the blood circulates in animals and those who hastily followed that imperfect analogy. If we see a house, Cleanthes, we conclude with the greatest certainty that it had an architect or builder, because this is precisely that species of effect which we have experienced to proceed from that species of cause. But surely you will not affirm that the universe bears such a resemblance to a house that we can with the same certainty infer similar causes or that the analogy is here entire and perfect. So that's, you know, he just says, you're, it sounds good, but the analogy really just doesn't work because, you know, you're talking about two different, entirely different things. Um, okay. Um, what else? Philo has some other suggestions about order. Did you pick up on that? I know it's fairly dense here, so you probably didn't get all these. Um, um, did, you, did you come? Okay, he says something on the next page that is quite interesting. Uh, he's still talking about Cleanthes' great metaphor, his great model here. Um, and he says, uh, he says, uh, uh, for aught we know, so for aught we can know a priori, matter may contain the source or spring of order originally within itself, as well as mind does. And there is no more difficulty in conceiving that the several elements from an internal unknown cause may fall into the most exquisite arrangement than to conceive that their ideas in the great universal mind take from a like internal unknown cause, fall into that arrangement. You get what he's saying here? What's he suggesting? That if uh, everything in the universe is ordered, then shouldn't like the mind of God be ordered in some sense? Yes, if, if that's the analogy you wanted to make. But he's suggesting something a little different here. I think he's mentioning that uh, the order could have arised naturally or arise by chance rather than by some creed. Okay, we're back to Aristotle. <laughs> but, yeah, he's, a, he's suggesting order can come from some other source than external source, is he not? Talking about a different way of thinking about order. Then, you know, it's something that somebody gave it to uh, in every instance. Yeah. Do you want to finish? Oh, no, just like yeah. order from within. Like, what would that even mean? Well, no. one, one example I'd look at that I, for me is a striking example of order without any kind of reason is the property of emergence, which you see on every scale. You can see it from, you're looking at, say, ant hills, where each ant is working towards, you know, in, in his own interest, or you look at economies, or like, look at, look at Los Angeles, right? Los Angeles is a city that doesn't have, that didn't have a set, like, city layout, from what I know. And it just kind of evolved because different zoning planners started Las building Vegas. this stuff, and all and out of it came this in, in remarkably ordered thing with no intentional design. So no architect sat down in the city and said, "This is what we're going to build." It was simply through the these individual agents' activities that a still an ordered structure came about, but there was no grand scheme involved. And I think that might serve as a 
as a case for this kind of self-regulated order? It's, it's, it's all over. We're all studying it. I mean, I don't care what your field is. I mean, there are principles of order that are, you know, emerged by the understanding of the principles of the materials themselves, whether it's, you know, uh, atomic attract, subatomic attraction, or whether it's uh, genetic. Uh, I mean, these are principles of order that are emerge out of the the things themselves, and nobody sits there and invents every every you know molecule of uh, you know carbon or every. I mean, you know, and the way in which they interact and create uh, orderly processes that we study. I mean, we don't have to go outside and figure out, well, where did this principle of order come? We study the substances themselves, the materials, the way they behave. So what he's suggesting is that, you know, Hume is offering these as provocative ways of thinking. And, you know, I think that's a great idea, is to look at all the different sides and don't discount them. But you know, this is a valid new approach to thinking about physical order of the world. Is Cleanthes view of the world as this perfect place, you know, an accurate view? Or is the world, you know, kind of you know, a certain level of chaos in the world that makes you wonder at times, uh, you know, we'll get, we'll, we'll get into this next class, but yeah. So we're still on the we're still on the natural religion argument, but uh, the force of this natural religious argument. I mean, this was I mean, this was a common view or approach by many of the scientific individuals of the time. Joseph Priestley, for example, who you know you know Priestley's work, oxygen and so forth. Uh, um, he, 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 he definitely believed that the complexity and order of the world was a product of a great creator, creative figure, a principle, if you will. So there are the, these group uh, of people, uh, some of them associated with what we call deism, who, who thought that you know, uh, there was a, there was a, a, a deistic principle that did create the world, but they sort of thought of it, of the principle of God more as an abstract figure. Newton himself was a very strong believer in, in I mean, notwithstanding the Principia and you know, his, all his work, uh, he was a very strong uh, believer in God. So he, he, he did believe that uh, the universe that he had discovered and the order and the, the, the gravitational order and the celestial motion and so forth was really a uh, advance into understanding the way that the mind of God worked. So there was this expression, as I mentioned earlier, up through nature to nature's God. You could sort of, and this was very much the principle of natural religion, the approach of natural religion to, you know, sort of observe the complexity and phenomena of the world and then understand through that that this showed that there was a great creative force of incredible capacity to put this order into the world. And that was uh, uh, widely, widely, <coughs> widely uh, shared view among many of the rationalists and uh, scientific figures of the day. Um, so this is sometimes what is called the telic universe, a universe that shows purpose, uh, a universe that shows that there was some kind of intention in creating it, as opposed to, I suppose, uh, uh, a non-telic universe would be one that did not, uh, in which uh, <coughs> it would be held, uh, did not show any particular purpose. There's no purpose. Um, so, uh, Cleanthes uh, comes up with a couple more suggestions for proving his idea that the order of the world is a very powerful proof of the existence of God.
What are they? He mentions the library, and he mentions the eye. What is he, what is he trying to say in these two analogies? What is a, what is a library, he says? What does he say a library when you read a book? How does he use that as an analogy? Anybody come across that? I guess this is a pretty challenging thing. Uh, but I, I like to go through it because it, it really does set out the different... Um, so he says here, this is in part three, um, he says, uh, uh, suppose that there is a natural universal invariable language uh, common to every individual of the human race, and that books are natural productions which perpetuate themselves in the same manner with animals and vegetables by descent and propagation. That is a book producing another book. I mean, it's kind of an absurd, but you know, he's using it for analogy. Um, um, several expressions of our passions contain a universal language. All brute animals have a natural speech, which, however limited, is very intelligible to their own species. And as there are infinitely fewer parts and less contrivance in the finest composition of eloquence than in the coarsest organized body, the propagation of an Iliad or an Aeneid, those are two great classical works, is an easier supposition than that of any plant or animal. <coughs> you following that? Uh, that's a little... What he's saying is it's easier to imagine that one book would produce another book because they're much simpler. Uh, I mean, this could be debated in many different ways, but it's an interesting example. Then that's, it's easier to imagine that happening than one animal producing another animal just like it. He's saying, you know, that's a pretty amazing thing that one animal can produce another animal. Um, and he goes on to say, suppose therefore that you enter into your library, thus peopled by natural volumes, uh, that is, volumes that have, can reproduce each other, containing the most refined reason and most exquisite beauty. Could you possibly open one of them and doubt that its original cause bore the strongest analogy to mind and intelligence? When it reasons and discourses, when it expostulates, argues, and reinforces its views and topics, when it applies sometimes to the pure intellect, sometimes to the affections, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, could you persist in asserting that all this at the bottom had really no meaning and that the first formation of this volume in the loins of its original parent proceeded not from thought and design? Are you following that? What's he suggesting here? The books. <coughs> Can see can be seen as a reflection of mind. Have to be seen. I mean, we wouldn't come up with a book and think, "Oh, this thing just, you know, got produced by fifty thousand monkeys typing for you know, a millennium." I mean, a book is an intention object. It's complex. It shows a sort of. Uh, a uh, evidence of an author. Everything, uh, everything in about a book suggests an author. So, this is, in in his view, another example of an an analogy that makes us appreciate the fact that something like nature, the book of nature, if you will, is the product of a great mind that is capable of creating it. Yeah. <coughs> he goes handpicking his analogies to make exactly the point he was. Surely if you pick if you pick certain things made by man, they're going to be ordered. But that the problem is is he doesn't seem to be willing to bring in analogies, for example, any kind of emergence properties that counter that argument. That are still perfectly good analogies that come from the the, the built environment, but just don't translate. So I I don't know about anyone else, but I found that a little bit lacking in that sure if you pick you pick only the green apples and not the red ones, you're you're only gonna have, you know, what you're looking for. So Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, well certainly your argument about LA is is one that uh, we're gonna explore when we look at um, Adam Smith. Because 
you know, what did Smith say? The, the economy. Who created the economy? We don't know. No, we <laughs> the economy exists, you know. And yet it shows, you know, uh, an incredible level of uh, order and, you know, process. And not that we can understand it perfectly, as we know, economists are you know, <coughs> not always correct. But, you know, there's a, there's a certain kind of order that emerges in these large systems that uh, we wouldn't say is the product of any single intellect. Charles? I think the gap between um, what Cleanthes uh, is trying to say about the books in the library and, say, the Book of Nature is that when we read a book, it's evident that there's a creator behind it because we can tell that it's both objective in many senses and, like, I, I guess, logical flow or something like that. But then at the same time, it's also got an element of subjectivity in it. And we know that it's subjective because we can compare it to other, um, other books where other authors might have other ideas. But if we tried to look at the book of nature, we might not be able to see. Maybe we can see, interpret some objectivity. But as for subjectivity, we would need to have other books of nature. Like maybe other things to like. So like, I feel like there's disconnect there. So there, you can't really say that there is definitely an author behind the book of nature because what human books have is subjectivity. And that's not what you say. Good point. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. There's, there's a certain kind of uh, uh, context to a book and content that. You know, the parallel doesn't extend to nature, and nature isn't like a text, really. Well, he comes up with another example. This is the I example, and this is a very famous example in, in Hume. Uh, he says, uh, uh, he says, now the, uh, this is still, clean, he's still pushing his natural religion approach. And, you know, one thing has got to be said about Hume, he's very thorough. So, you know, by the time you've got through the, the chapter, short as it is, uh, he's really given you a lot of different ways of thinking about this concept of natural religion. And it's a really important thing to do because he's, he's trying to set the stage for thinking about valid alternatives. <coughs> and I think he does his best in many ways to give each alternative the strongest uh, account that he can. I mean, he's not, uh, I don't get the sense myself, I know you, you can all tell me what you think at the, when we finish the book, that he's really, you know, thumping for one of these views. And in fact, as I said, there's been scholarly ink spilled over, you know, which view does he really himself uh, accept? And that's really, to me, uh, an amazing achievement. That somebody, but anyway, he, he goes on. So Cleanthe goes on with this argument of the I. Now, the arguments for natural re religion are plainly of this kind, and nothing but the most perverse, obstinate metaphysics can reject them. So he's a little sp special pleading here. Consider, anatomize the I, survey its structure and contrivance, and tell me from your own feelings if the idea of a contriver does not immediately flow in upon you with a force like that of sensation. The most obvious conclusion surely is in favor of design, and it requires time, perfection, and study to summon up those frivolous, though abstruse, objections which can support infidelity. Who can behold the male and female of each species, the correspondence of their parts and instincts, their passions, and the whole course of life before and after generation, but must be sensible that the propagation of the species is intended by nature? So what about the I argument? This is a, a biological, so this is a little more, you know, he's getting into the nitty-gritty here now. <coughs> How is he using this argument of the eye? Sort of a detail. By, by saying it's way too complex, yeah. either it should have happened. Yeah. How could this, how could this simply being made? <coughs> Somebody made this. I mean, it's, it's vastly more complicated than anything we can make. You know, so how can we have eyes if 
something didn't, some great power didn't, didn't create this possibility or actually create I mean, it, it's not explained exactly how all this works when we talk about creation, but, but nevertheless, the existence of an I in Cleanthes' view is, makes it almost impossible to deny that there is some force in creation that led to this kind of complexity that makes it possible for all these different animals organisms to actually see. I mean, he just can't come up with another explanation. It's just like, and even the, the, the notion that uh, Philo has said, well, maybe things have an internal principle in themselves that create the order. What internal principle can create an eye? I mean, this is one of the most complex organs that we can imagine, and we're not even close to being able to do that as humans. It's vastly more complicated than anything we know how to do. So this is, again, his... his um, so to, to Cleanthes, the eye is just, you know, it's, it's all but proof of the existence of God. There's really no concept of how something could emerge out of these internal principles, if you will. You know, maybe as as uh, Philo says that you know there are internal principles that lead to certain kinds of order, but we don't have a mechanism to understand what that is at this time, and Hume doesn't either. So I mean, you have to look at you have to so historically when you think of Cleanthes, this is this is a pretty this is a pretty powerful set of arguments, and. You know, if you're a rationalist and an empiricist, um, that's that's pretty state-of-the-art reflection on the order of the world. Yeah. How well, how would they account for for things like mules? Because surely, like, what? They, like mules, because surely they had mules back then. And I I'd just be curious to think, you know, so. You know, designer designs a horse and he designs a donkey and they're meant for their purpose. They do their thing and, you know, but just by some fluke, one horse and one donkey get together and all of a sudden you've got this third thing. Now, is it automatic? Was it designed that the horse and the donkey be pre-programmed for this case where they should should meet each other or, or not? Well, you know, the that. Liger. Huh? huh? The liger. Yeah, right? <laughs> just how do you, how does the notion of design account for these experiences they surely knew about for, for things like, you know, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, I suppose the first the the first thing to say would be they probably didn't know about all the you know weird things and and you know nature had what they called uh, what what were called monsters aberrations. aberrations yeah and and nature was full of aberrations I mean people were aware of that but they they saw them as sort of uh, in the Aristotelian sense as uh, accidental things. Demia is not having a good time. I, I, I don't know if you've followed his comments here, but he doesn't like this speculation. Demia feels that once, so Demia is the orthodox believer. He feels once you get into this kind of discussion, no telling where it's going to go. I mean, you're sort of leaving the proof of God to reason. Uh, you know, to him, that's, that's, that's profane. To actually put up this argument about God and say, yeah, we can prove God to him, that is a very slippery slope. Because once you allow that kind of discussion of this question, who knows where the conclusions are going to go? And... To him, it's a completely inappropriate approach to contemplating God. It's, you know, sacrilegious. Whereas Cleanthes thinks, you know, in his empirical and his, you know, his, his sense of the science and scientific revolution, he's got Newton behind him, he's got Ben Franklin behind him, all these great figures who 
and they were all deists. They believed in God. They believed in a force that created this incredible world. And, you know, Newton was just, uh, just completely um, uh, taken with this, this order that he had discovered and a sense that he had found, you know, uh, some way of getting closer to the creation. So that's, that's really, in many ways, what Hume means Cleanthes to represent, is this sort of this great expression of human understanding and knowledge and new knowledge. And as this knowledge unfolded and developed, it showed a picture of order, an order that was uh, deeply impressive. And so these, these uh, natural theologians, they call themselves, well, people call them natural theologians, actually use this as a, a powerful, what they thought was a powerful set of approaches to understanding and, and proving the existence of God. And this movement of, uh, of, of uh, natural theology existed in Darwin's day. These are, you know, these are people who are we would associate with, you know, state-of-the-art science who, who, really, um, who really thought about religion as a natural sub a subject of, of, uh, that you could speculate about through examining natural phenomena. That's a, a, an amazing expression of the Enlightenment, of, you know, the fact that you could understand everything Reason was this powerful thing, and you know, if you applied it appropriately and effectively, you could understand almost anything.